Schönen guten Abend, herzlich willkommen im Architekturzentrum Wien zu unserem leider letzten Abend in dieser Reihe gemeinsam mit der IBAW. Welcome to at the Architekturzentrum Wien to our last event in this series, uh, this very nice cooperation with the International Building Exhibition IBA Wien Social Housing. Uh, actually, if any of anybody of you hasn't been yet to the exhibition, the final presentation of the IBA Wien, go there at Nordwestbahnhof. I think it's only a few days, a few weeks, so it's ending in November. So, nine days. Huh? nine days to go. So, please go there. It's really it's an excellent exhibition, excellent overview on uh, social housing in Vienna. Today. Uh, or tonight, I'm very happy to welcome Mette Skjold from SLA Architects from Copenhagen. Welcome, Mette. Uh, and I would like to start with a quote from SLA. Everywhere our ambition and mission are the same, to design places for life, all life. And I think the important thing in this quote is all life, especially now uh, being in the context of the IBA Wien, so in the context of social housing, uh, I think we uh, first of all think about the well-being of humans, of humans uh, but I think at the same time by now we know or we should know that we cannot disconnect the needs of humans from other living or non-living beings. We are part of a continuous web and we will not survive without saving the planet. During the last years, we have been experiencing heat waves, rising air and noise pollution, and the negative impacts of these emissions are not equitably distributed. So ecological justice is part of social justice. We will have to pay more attention to nature in our cities, or to phrase it in technical planning, planning terms, to green and blue infrastructure. That's why this year we are uh, devoting our series with the IBA Wien uh, to the groundbreaking wor work of landscape architecture. And I'm very pleased that tonight we have SLA with us. It's an outstanding landscape architecture firm. Uh, their, their projects are shaping a new image of urban nature that is both aesthetically new and biologically diverse, resilient and sustainable. Many of these projects are interwoven with social housing estates. I think that's especially interesting for Vienna and for the context of the IBA Wien. Uh, in tonight's event, uh, we will first have a lecture by Mette from SLA, and this will then be followed by a conversation with Lili Litschka, our second guest, who will act as respondent. Thanks a lot, Lili, for joining us, and I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. But before I introduce both of you, I would take, like to take the chance to thank Lene Benz, who has been the creator of this series from couple of years now, and you did a great job creating this and coordinating, and I think we should give her a hand at this time. Uh, and of course, thanks to the whole team of the ArtsitW helping us every time with these events. And now I would like to invite our partner on stage, Kurt Hofstetter, coordinator from IBA Wien. Welcome, Kurt. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, as you said, it's the last time in a series of quite a few years now we have been working together. Uh, International Building Exhibition, IBA meets Architects, and uh, thank you for curating this with such a nice and interesting way. I think we had a uh, really lot of interesting guests from all over the world, and uh, I personally am very glad that the last time we have in Eva mit Architects, we have Eva mit Landscape Architects, uh, which is very important. And uh, when we talk about social housing, I think it's not about only housing. We really try to talk about not only building, but a lot about attitude, about values, about uh, living qualities. And 
everybody who is in the room, and uh, I see some of, of the profession, know how hard it has been for so many years to talk about the value of public space, of landscaping, and this has changed in the last years. And I'm so happy about that. Uh, and it's good to have a lot of young people here uh, because uh, I think this is exactly the combination uh, looking at these values and attitudes uh, from a new perspective and really uh, carrying whatever we can into the future and using uh, uh, this energy and the potential of uh, you said natural based design, I think, is what you're working with. And I'm very glad to, uh, to, to hear more about it, uh, because uh, that is what we have to live on in the, in the next years and work with very intensely. So let us take this chance. And I'm uh, thanking you for uh, coming from Denmark. Uh, and um, I'm looking forward to hear your presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, before I give the stage to you, Mette, let me briefly introduce you and your office. Uh, you are a partner and CEO at SLA Architects in Copenhagen. SLA has been designing open air public spaces around the world for 30 years now, many of them prize winning. SLA designs on all scales, citywide master plans, climate adaptation, inner city open spaces or residential green spaces, such as in Denmark's largest social housing estate in Gellerup, uh, Gellerup in Aarhus. I think he will also show that in your lecture. Mette leads uh, SLA strategic urban planning with em emphasis on sustainability and environmental, economic and social terms. Uh, Mette is also responsible, and this sounds really very um, challenging, at the studio for the, maybe the most complicated stakeholder and involvement processes, processes, the collaboration with residents, public authorities, and different other builders and stakeholders. And I think it's all about these processes in projects like the, the ones you are showing in a short time. Furthermore, Mette is also chairman of architecture and building policy at Danske Ark and a member of Copenhagen Municipality Business Council. And she has been teaching and lecturing extensively. And I think that's also something which is connecting you to our respondent today, to Lili Litschka, who is also, of course, a very known teacher in Vienna, but is also very active in, let's say, policy making and uh, networking and building up institutions. And, yeah. But now, Mette, I'm again very happy that you're here tonight and I look very much looking forward to your lecture. The stage is yours. Thank you. And a warm thank you to you, Lene. We've been talking since seven months, and uh, it has not been frequently, but we have been on mail and uh, on, uh, on online meeting. Uh, and thank you very much, Angelica and Kurt, for the kind introduction. It's an honor to be here and uh, to see all of these people that is interested in what we do. So I'll do my best. We are a nature-based design studio, and we design places for life, all life. So not only for humans, but also for the flora and the fauna. Because we deeply believe, and we know for a fact, from IPCC's reports, from a biodiversity, crisis, biodiversity crisis, that we really need to push and to put forward that agenda. Yes, it works. We uh, are a learning and sharing organization on a mission to create better conditions for all life. Um, you could say that 
I don't know, do you know Sesame Street? I don't know what it's called in, in German, but the Muppet Show, they have the power of we as a, as a quote. And that's how we work and operate at SLA. So if you are an office clerk, or you are an intern, or you're a senior designer, or a project manager, all people are valued and their contrib contributions to our projects are seen and heard. So from my point of view as a leader, I think the biggest sort of uh, success of SLA is actually to build the studio and the culture around doing this. And of course, we don't do it only ourselves. We collaborate with many different, both knowledge institutions, but also specialists in different fields. This is a project uh, in, uh, in Denmark. And we also have an obligation as, society, as, contemporary, as contemporary society to, to bring forward nature to our children and our next generations. And this is a facility, it's a multi-universe where you can explore the powers of nature. It's called Naturkraft, uh, and it's, uh, it's in Denmark. You can come and visit once. Yeah, so our ambition and eagerness to explore and learn new is present in every project. This is a project, a hospital, where we are adding in uh, trees that is not standing upright, so they are not like vertical, but they are lying down in, or, in order to, to create a more, a better resilient nature and a habitat for, for different types of fauna. Our work spans uh, from award-winning climate uh, adaptation projects in Copenhagen, uh, the green-blue transformation that I will go through uh, of Denmark's largest social housing estate in Aarhus, the second biggest city of Denmark, and the design of Norway's new government area in Oslo to an urban biodiversity park. That's the picture here. It just in 2021, won the World Landscape of the Year category. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a park in Abu Dhabi that, uh, that actually lowers the temperature, but also uh, filters noise so people can go outside. And it lowers the temperature and, it, and the irrigation because it's built as a forest with native species. The irrigation cost is, or the irrigation amount of water used is lowered by 40%. Yeah. Um, we are not only architects and designers and planners. We believe in, in, in the value proposition on a, broad, on a broad scale, you could say. So we have biologists, we have anthropologists, and then we have a group of specialists that, that, from soil experts to plant experts, to tree experts to ecosystems experts. So, in general, we have the power of we culture, but we also allow in, in individual training and learning and, and developing of their passion. And I believe that if you have passion at work, then you can definitely move and do something new and do good. So <clears throat> you could say that with knowledge on nature's ecosystem services and how nature feels and function for people by design. So that's kind of the equation that all our projects go through. And it goes not linear, so it's a circle one, so it's sort of, but that's kind of our, our mission in another, put in another way. And our services are manifold. We, not, we, we don't only operate as landscape architects. Around 40% of what we do is on strategic urban planning scale, but also master plans and how to sort of start with actually landscape and nature, which in general is the starting point for our lives, but also for the cities that we live in. And currently we are experiencing a pull on biodiversity, bionet gain, green cover, because, I mean, during COVID, 
people in, in general living in cities was, was almost uh, lying about n natural experiences, no? Uh, uh, and, and so it was, it's a huge demand at the moment to sort of have that close, close to heart, but also close to home uh, in cities all over. And you could say that it's about time that we feel that urge. Yeah, so we also have like, a, this is a matrix, but it's just to show you how we collect knowledge and how we try to, to, to sort of share knowledge on, on different papers that we distribute and that we are completely open about across uh, the three studios, but also across different uh, you could say disciplines or areas where landscape architecture or urban space in general operates. So from microclimate simulation to security, working with this government area in, in Oslo, you need to sort of security regulate that it doesn't, you know, scream, this is like super Fort Knox, but it's in, included into the urban fabric or the, you know, the floor of, uh, of the city. And we take our own medicine. We go camping. This is the last camp we did in, uh, uh, it was actually in two, last year, in August 2021. And we debate and meet and talk and invite people in to talk about how they regard nature-based design and what, why we should do even better. It's almost, you know, it's almost like the Lion King. I, I feel like singing the Lion King song, you know, the introduction song. Anyways, I won't do it. Um, but this is like just on, 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 it's one of, you could say, the basis that we come back to, uh, trying to explain what nature-based design is. And it's not about introducing wolves and mooses. Uh, it's not about mimicking nature but it's about understanding the performance of nature, how it feels and function, and putting that into design. In general, to, to create more livable cities. So not so only sustainable cities, but livable cities. Yes. And, and, uh, and our approach is, I mean, not only surface. You have to know what's the growth medium. You have to have a holistic, a full circle, in, in understanding also the value that is proposed from nature, even from CO2 that is captured in soil over time, the roots, uh, how it's infiltering um, and so forth. So this is just a nice example of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a rhizome and, and a, wood, a, a root structure underneath ground. And very often nature is regarded uh, almost linear, I know this is a circle, but <laughs> that it's sort of, you put a sprout, you make a seed, and then it matures over time, and then it, then it decays and, and, and sort of goes out of system. But what really happens is called ecological succession. Um, and that's the process by which the mix of species and habitat, so, so the, the home for Habitat, you know what that means. I don't need to explain that. Uh, in an area of changes, changes over time. So it's a very robust system. And it always, working nature-based design, working with putting as much nature as we can into all our projects, you always are context specific because you have the dynamics of climate, on that specific site, being drought, being heavy rain, being moisture, being whatever happens, uh, he yeah. Um, whereas um, you always also, um, you have to know what's underneath, what's the soil, what type of growth medium are we working with. And that's how we go about, you could say that cities as well is also a system. It's, it responds to our behavior and need it, uh, it changes over time. And the way we work, both in planning, but also in, in urban spaces, is that we look at the hydrological cir circuit. How is like the system of water in this area? What's the, what's the native species? How is that operating? How can we make it resilient so it can actually grow? 
uh, and how does then the social life respond to that? And then we create synergies between those circles. So it's another way of the circle that I showed before about nature, people, and design. It's another way of regarding it. And this is uh, from a headquarter of a large pharmaceutical company uh, in uh, a little bit outside of Copenhagen Center. And they uh, decided to change their, one of their, you could say, uh, almost fabrication lots, so like a industrial area into their global headquarter. And when we then planted all these trees in different ages, up to 30 years of age and in different species, one of the trees were not like super relevant for planting. So then we said to the facility manager, but the best you can do, Jan, is to actually put this tree in the pack. And he said, well, you know that this is our global headquarter. And we said, yes, we know that. And then he said, well, okay, we'll find a spot far away from the main entrance, and then we can start there. And now they are monitoring the biodiversity. It's increasing both flora and fauna, and now it's part of their way of maintaining this area. So now you even find it close to the entrances. So it's a way of pushing, you know, almost like Lilia and I just had a, a brief talk about, it's a, it's a way of pushing the aesthetics uh, towards uh, a more, yeah, a more, a more robust nature and a more uh, resilient nature and a, a much more exp nature where that has like a, a lot of values in it, where you can listen to a bird, see a butterfly, and and so on. I'll go through these um, these uh, three cases. Uh, and uh, Lini was uh, selecting the first two of them, and then I added the, 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 the third one. And then I also have like a brief, uh, short presentation of, of some uh, projects that we've done, done, just done in Copenhagen. I will only show projects from Copenhagen and only the realized project. So I'm not showing so many drawings. The first project is uh, in, in Gellerup, where we in 2015 won a competition for a new park. At that time, it was the largest park we've ever done. And uh, I guess all cities have these types of neighborhoods. Um, you could say it's, it's, a, it's a very Cartesian way of, of, of putting uh, houses on, on earth, so, so to say. And um, yeah, it was, I mean, I, I guess you can recognize these type of, of neighborhoods. It's like the heydays of modernism. We all have it. Um, and this is in April 2014. There's around 6,000 residents in this, uh, in this neighborhood. Uh, more, uh, more than 50% is uh, unemployed. There's around 80 nationalities living in this area and more than 35% is below 18 of age. So just to, to sum up, there's a lot of capacity for being active, being outdoor, being you know, caring, maintaining. There's a lot of capacity of people to actually live and, and make this neighborhood more safe to move around. But this was the case. And I mean, if you, if you were the first one to picnic on this side, you you would be quite, uh, uh, you know, yeah, you would, you, that would challenge me. I mean, to take my cloth and go down here and have a picnic with my children, that would be challenging, you know, because you would be surveyed from all over uh, and you would definitely be a first mover. So basically it's saying that this space in between the houses would, was not like a series of spaces, outdoor spaces or activities. It was, you know, one dimensional and really well cut as a lawn. <clears throat> so the idea here was um, that the social housing union was set off to sell off land in order to create a more diverse offer of houses, but also uh, the city of Aarhus moved a thousand workplaces uh, into this 
neighborhood. So the idea was to create a more, yeah, a more self-sustained but also a very diverse neighborhood in programming, coming from only social housing. And for se the, the most important issue was that the existing residents, none of them in this you know, change over time, should be uh, forced to move. So the, the competition for the park was to make a space for the existing residents. And uh, the concept for doing that, I mean, I met, I, I, actually the engineer that did the uh, technical um, part of the project, uh, leading the technical, uh, the engineer services, he lives like 100, 100 meters away from this area and he, had never, he has never visited Kellerup. So it is like an island. So the idea was, how do we open it up how do we make smaller neighborhoods in order to connect and to sort of make it physical accessible so it's the easy route um, and, and, uh, and make it a part of Aarhus? Yes. So in the beginning, it was more like a landscape, a farm in the, in the center. I, I don't, I can't look at the, I don't have any pointer. Anyways, um, and this is very small. Oh, there's the pointer. Mm, not really. Turn on, that's a good idea. Perfect. but this is the microphone. Anyways, it works. Anyways, it started with being a meadow and then it came, I can't see the, I might do like this, no. This is a little bit hard, I'm sorry about that. It started with kind of a, a you could say almost like a village and a farm landscape, and then came the, the, the development, the new proposed landscape was then a new base where you actually had the local soil balance on site. We did have to move a lot of soil uh, with meadows and rolling hills, so like kind of the base that it was visible from indoor, from entrance to entrance, but also that it was coherent and it, and the blue and the green was uh, was connected, and then giving diverse vegetation. I'll get into that later. Um, yes, so putting in uh, a, a series of programs, uh, the local rainwater strategy going from north to south, collecting the rainwater and then collect, connecting that to the path where you actually feel safe and that is illuminated uh, during dark hours. But what we did for the, as, as, as sort of a, a pioneer in this area was that because of uh, the change in infrastructure, the small football field in, 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 in natural grass was, uh, was demolished. And you can imagine having so many young people that if you don't have a place to, if, to play football, then uh, they will find out something else to do and maybe not only good things. So the first thing we did for this park was to create a artificial grass football field, soccer field, 11 by 11, illuminated with a stand. So the usage of this football field could be 24-7. Uh, so that was quite an harassment. I think it took us around f six months. Uh, and here uh, you can see that that's definitely <laughs> the first green spot. And here we are in the middle, it's 2017. We haven't planted yet. But some of the trees, the existing trees during to, due to that we had to move and, and change the terrain so much, we took them and put them into deposit in order to plant them later. And here is a, is, a, is a nice view. 
uh, where people also during construction are actually uses the park. Um, and we planted a lot of different species, also species that uh, is exotic. So where the microclimate actually allows, we, played, we, we placed a lot of uh, and planted a lot of exotic species, also edible species for people to enjoy, but also as an homage to all these different nationalities and a sense of home um, for them. So they were part of selecting, part of understanding, part of, uh, of learning about these new types of nature that we introduced. Yeah, and this is the image of, of the different species, of some of them. And you can, you can design spaces for a certain use, but then something else happens. And this is like uh, the end of Ramadan in 2019, and definitely the space is not only designed for this, at least, but it's so nice to see that it can also be used uh, for, for these type of events as well. And uh, this is a corner uh, of the park. You see it before and after. And uh, the corner is then uh, rainwater managing the, uh, get on surface. Uh, it's a green open space, but it's also mobility so you can access as uh, if you're on wheelchair, if you're on bike, if you're on, 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 on foot, uh, et cetera. So sometimes it's about physically opening up uh, this area, at least it was here in Gellerup. Understanding the soil for what types of vegetation do you need to have some natural ingredients in order to you know, level the pH value for the understory and so forward, that was, that was a big part of this project. Um, and then we always go with the client out and select trees. And that's definitely a treat at Italy to go out there. I haven't even done it myself, but I've seen so many pictures of it. Uh, and maybe someday I will get to it as well. So we have a close collaboration with plant nurseries in general in all over Europe. Yeah. And the funny thing is that when we planted these six types, six species of uh, six types of uh, cherry trees. Like the day after, uh, there was like bumblebees summing around. So fauna is super fast, forest pigeon after a week in the pine trees, making a nest. And even on, under construction, there was a big fat rabbit uh, chasing, chasing the, 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 the construction bulldozer around. And this is like a, a normal day by the lake. And then I have a small video because the, the project was actually just shown at the Oslo Triennale. So we made a video together with the social housing showing what, what everyday life is at this park and how it has changed. Um, yes, there's no sound on it, but then you maybe get a grasp on how it is and how it feels. And this is like, um, he's eating these, it's not blackberries, but it's a black berry. And it's very kind of, and he says like, well, I don't know if it's edible, but I'll do it anyway. Um, yeah, and by the lake. Yeah. So Natur Park is a, a campus park. It's a research facility in the city center of Copenhagen. The house is designed by CF Müller, a Danish architecture firm, doing the buildings, and we won this design competition in 2010. But it has taken quite a while uh, because it's a complex place. Um, the client's vision was to create a new research complex uh, with attractive surroundings, but also inviting and generous to the surrounding uh, neighbors. Uh, this is uh, the location of this spot is, is one of the densest populated areas of Copenhagen. And if you go like a hundred years back, it was a grazing common. So that's also a way of looking how that was actually the soil condition underneath the pavement. Yeah. And one of the reasons we won was that it was generous. So it was inviting in, was opening up. 
opening up. I mean, before this, the campus was fenced off and, and, and not very accessible. But the idea here was to create a series of routes, public, uh, publicly open, 24-7, um, both for bike, bikes and pedestrians uh, um, in general. And here you see a bike, a bicyclist. And then also on the rainwater in such a, it's really like in the city center of, 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 of Copenhagen. It's also collecting rainwater for the neighboring sites uh, under, and, 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 and you know, making it float underneath ground uh, through a natural filter used for the gray water in the house, but also used for irrigation and cooling down the surface uh, during hot days. And it's a meeting spot. There's these small dots where people can meet, both the researchers, I mean, going outside, but also people from, from uh, the neighboring houses and the neighboring city. And this is like a big, it's a, it's a long pedestrian and bicycli bicyclist um, a bridge. Uh, so that allows uh, different types of nature to actually grow and, and, and uh, and become much more natural in their way of, uh, of appearance, but also their way of, uh, of growing. Yeah, and the vegetation uh, aspires from how is a grazing common, what types of nature, what types of species uh, is uh, related to that, and then differed in, in different types of, uh, of spaces. So you get like a variety of, of of spaces that you can explore when you visit the site. And this is a view from the front and the main entrance. And here you have a view during dark hours with light. And we also did the light design on this one. And there's also a tendency to illuminate cities too much. And as you see here, the light is more warm. Uh, so it's more inviting and still ensures that people have, can move safely uh, through the site. So the project, next project is, uh, is, is a climate adaptation project that we did in, it was also a competition we won in Copenhagen. It was a pilot on how to include city nature into a street and a roundabout in order for making the city more resilient towards future heavy rain events. Com Copenhagen was completely paralyzed during 2000, I think it was the 7th or the 6th of July, 2011, and it costed the city, or, you know, the, the, rest, the people in the city, it was our tax money, I guess, who uh, to renovate the city, it costed around 1 billion euros. And none of these money was used for making the city more resilient towards the next event. So that, of course, made the city think, what should we do in the future? How should we make the city resilient? Because we cannot have these type of events and these type of costs uh, too many times. And how do we make, um, how do we include city nature into the resiliency of the city, but also the hydrological circuit of the city. <clears throat> and for many cities, this is still a fact that nature is something that is outside the city borders. And cities in general is hardscape. And we have learned this, we have operated with this for many, many years. But the way we go about is to include nature into the site into the city in order to uh, create a, a more livable city, but also on hardcore values. I mean, the utility values, the value proposition of working like this, both uh, embedding CO2 uh, in like embedded, but also the one we all learned in, in, our, in our school that, that plants, while they grow, they, they convert CO2 into oxygen. No? So it's, it's kind of common knowledge, it's not something that we invent, but it's also about creating um, cleaning air, uh, filtering noise, um, 
preventing heat islands, stuff like that, more hardcore facts that this kind, this type of nature-based solution can, can offer to cities. But then there's also like the more softer values, like the amenity values about creating a community, a sense of belonging, knowing, caring, meeting, etc., a community. And this is a, a picture at the roundabout. And, and we use this picture to say that it's about, we think that this looks a little bit like a forest, but it's a roundabout, no? So it's more about how does this roundabout nature-based design actually feels and function. And here you have a map of, um, and it's a little bit opposite. The water actually goes upwards, up north. That's against, you know, common. But that's, that's, the, that's the graduation of, of this site. Um, and the idea is, I mean, for, for 100 years, we've been making the section of infrastructure convex in order to get the water away, whereas this is basically to do it concave in order to put in nature and, and create uh, a more, and include both the blue and the green and, and also the, the people uh, infrastructure into this. And this was the roundabout before, and this is how it looked uh, a half a year after we planted. And here you have, um, I think, to some ex extent we use this project to say, because the, the capacity of the infrastructure, the amount of parking spaces is still the same, even down to, you know, turning, turning curves, how, how, how big a car can actually turn in the roundabout. So I use, we use this to say that there is room for nature in cities. If we can make it like this, then uh, we can definitely. And we planted around 600 trees. And already uh, our biologists, they can't help monitoring our own, so they go into field work. And already 100 new species of fauna has found habitat uh, in, a, in a roundabout and a normal housing street. And it's become uh, a spot, an Instagram spot, um, which we, we love to follow because we actually also find how people interact and use the space, how they, they use it as, their, as part of their everyday life and not only as a transit. Um, and here you have a drawing from before and after and this is a, a drone shot from, uh, from last summer. And then I have a small video that actually has a sound and if I click, whoa, it works. I have a small water problem up here. If anyone has a tissue, that would be wonderful. <laughs> um, about the roundabout, there is, uh, 
When we won the competition, the idea was that it shouldn't be salted. So that means a different, that means a specific type of nature allowance. But then during, uh, during the design phases, the city of Copenhagen decided, well, you need to salt it anyway. So we had to change the, uh, the whole system of water and irrigation. Uh, so right now, it's, it's a very low, uh, it's a very banal way of doing it, but we have a certain dwell that has a winter situation and a summer situation. So that was just what I tried to tell you from while you saw the movie, but I, there was, thank you very much. Um, so the last quick three projects. No, I have a little time yet. No rush. Um, we just incubated this uh, courtyard uh, in Copenhagen six weeks ago. So what you see here is the mayor for technique and urban space. I don't know how to say it in German. Anyways, um, it is part also of the same strategy for the city of Copenhagen as St. Kils and Bryggervangen was. So how do we include rainwater management and nature in general into our urban realm and still create spaces for people to enjoy and, and, and create a community and a sense of belonging, a sense of home. And from in, in, in 2018, there was a big research project uh, conducted by uh, Aarhus University um, it was uh, released. The, project, the, the research ha was done on a million children living in Europe. And it was conducted, uh, it was done by satellite photos, so how we move around. Um, from, from given birth to the age of 18. And one of the conclusions from this research was that children actually grow, growing up with an everyday contact with nature minimizes the risk of the 17 largest mental diseases by 50%. So we need to give this to our children. We also need to give nature to ourselves in the city, and nature that is actually responding to our whereabouts, how we behave, but also gives us, uh, aspire our senses and, uh, and so forth. So that's also part of it. There's, there's a lot of children living in this specific house. Uh, and here you have a site. Uh, the site is, I'll see if I can point now. Yeah, the site is this triangular. Uh, and the courtyard is actually these two triangles. Right here there's a, there's a, there's a private school. And the, the, the courtyard belongs to this long stretch of houses. It's a very noisy, you see the Ringstraße uh, around uh, the city of Copenhagen, so it's a very, and it's, it's, it's a long, so it's a very noisy, the, 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 the traffic is very noisy and also polluting uh, uh, at this area. So the general idea was uh, to create these earth stamped earth walls. It's not concrete, but it's stamped. It's a, a stamped earth wall, you could say. That's what it is. I'll show you the images. And create uh, um, a new uh, set of urban spaces, uh, a new series of, of bigger trees. There was some existing trees. It was actually done by C.T. Hosanson, which is a very famous Danish landscape architect. And then simulating what does it mean on a 100-year rain event when water really sort of, how do we retain it and, and, and uh, store it? Uh, and that would change the whole atmosphere of the area. And this is looking down from, from one, of the, one of the apartments, the view. It's, uh, it's a house for storage and for garbage. Uh, and uh, we reused a lot of pavement uh, from, from uh, the city of Copenhagen. They have this storage where you can go and see, is there anything we can use in this? Um, and it was actually from this, you could say, the state hospital renovation. Uh, and then we also reused, I mean, this is like the first house SLA has ever done. And I'm, I'm not sure we're doing it. It's a orangerie, 
Is that, do you know what that means? It's a common house. Um, and that's reuse of the windows that they changed in the, in the, house, in, in the housing block, uh, creating uh, this nice spot. And here you see the wall, but you also see the house in, in like the background. To another project in uh, Tingbjerg, that's a social housing area, uh, 10 kilometers from this, the, the town hall of Copenhagen, so not far away. <clears throat> Here we, we won uh, the, the urban plan in order to densify and make another, you could say another series of housing proposals, both privately owned, but also semi-privately owned. Um, in this area. It's, uh, the story goes like this, that it was CTH Sørensen was actually the landscape architect who was hired to do this housing area. And then he said, well, I'm not, I'm not doing the houses. So I'll call my best friend, Sten Eiler Rasmussen. I don't know if you know him, but he's like a famous Danish architect from the, from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So he did um, these houses. And the idea here is to densify there's a lot of space, but there's also, you know, it's surrounded by magnificent nature that is not part of how it, you actually have the urban space inside the housing area. So it's kind of, you know, also this island in the middle of this nice nature of, uh, of Copenhagen, surrounding Copenhagen. And if you, I know this is a little blurred, but if you, as an architect, look into an area like this, it's almost like a glossy image. Well, you can only do it like in these tiles because you cannot touch this uh, fantastic cultural heritage that we have here. But if you look at the newspapers, it's a different set of stories that comes forward. Um, and that's what the outside actually hear and, and listen and reads about these uh, areas. But if you are a resident, it's a, it's a whole different way of, of looking into the everyday life. Um, so the idea here was to, to add townhouses, uh, new housing blocks, new types of houses into the area, and then connect the surrounding nature and the access to the surrounding nature, but also have like a spill-in effect from these nature values into this uh, center. Um, and we have, this is a picture of the first eight townhouses. When they were, the, the general idea is here that we should build uh, 1,500 new houses in this area. The first eight houses, when they were kind of, you know, open for who wants to buy, who wants to live here, they had 1,300 uh, applicants over over two two weeks. So there was definitely a demand and a wish and a need. Um, and this is this is a private owned house in an area like this. Uh, then it was uh, down to uh, that you had to make a specific why do I as a person or a family want to live here? And then they had like a 380 applicants and it was there was only eight houses, no? And one of them is still like an a showroom, so it was basically seven houses. Um, but the idea here is that it's low cost, it's, it's below market value, but if you, if, you, if you as a house owner sell in the first five years that you live there, you need to give half of the revenue to the existing housing union. So there's a whole new set of regulation in order to create a more diverse neighborhood, a more uh, safe neighborhood, and to sort of open up uh, this area. So I'll just run you through some pictures that, I've, that we've done um, to see how they, they live and how, and in, these, in between these two blocks of four houses, there's actually small allotments for the existing residents that they can go and, and, and use and, 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 and rent for uh, one to, to three years and to grow uh, in this. And that's all the, also a way of almost like, you know, 
nudging uh, people to meet so it's not us and them and so forward. A view from, from the inside, one of the houses. And then last, not least, this is a, a big area uh, between the airport and the city of Copenhagen called Ørsted. And it's just to tell you that you, we also do maintenance design. And, and it does cost um, money to maintain a lawn. But it's also almost like a green desert, no? Uh, it, it's a monoculture, so what we did here for the House in Union, we said, well, okay, how much does it cost to maintain this grass lawn per year? And that was a specific number. Okay, what if we stretch this amount to five years, and then after five years, then the cost is lowered? And they said, okay, we can finance that. And then we did like a, a whole new types of, of spaces and basically planted different type of species in order for, for creating something that is nice to look at, nice to explore, but also that creates life, place for life, both regarding biodiversity and flora and fauna. Yes. That's it. Thanks a lot, Mette, for this brilliant lecture and for these very nice projects and examples. I think it gives us a lot of food for thought that uh, Lily can also react to and connect it to the Viennese context. And I think you can really see how the image of nature and of nature-based spaces has changed dramatically, the aesthetics of it, but of course also, more important, the biodiversity. Uh, but let me briefly just uh, introduce Lili Litschke. Uh, she uh, is professor since and, and head of uh, the Department of Landscape Architecture at the BOKU, the University of Natural Resources and Applied Life Sci Sciences in Vienna. Uh, she was head of uh, Kozilitschka until 2016 and started LLL Landscape Architecture in 2017. And as I said before, she's also a great policymaker and networker and also activist. Founding. She has founded different platforms next, like Nextland and she's also co-founder of an interventionist collective, the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> which is always doing really nice performances, interventions. And of course, she's a landscape designer and researcher. Uh, Lily, I would like uh, give you the first opportunity to start this conversation or to yeah. react well, to Mette. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, uh, to Lene and to you uh, and also to the IBA, uh, for organizing this uh, very interesting lecture with Mette. Thank you for your inspiring talk. I would like to touch three topics, more or less. Um, and let me just dive into it, if that's OK. Go ahead. <laughs> OK. <laughs> One is, uh, if you compare the, the situation here to what you have shown, I, I mean that I, you're not um, the only designer, and there might be others as well who, who work differently, but still, one of the large, one of the huge differences I see is that um, you work with a process, uh, which is very rare here because it's very hard to sell a process uh, and not a product. Mm. And uh, even the projects which claim to deal with processes, a succession, and uh, also perhaps social uh, developments, mm. are very hard to to put on the ground. I mean, they might be able to, we might be able to sell the idea, but then even to realize it, it's very hard because it takes time also for the, uh, for the commissioners. 
So how do you uh, how do you argue for that, or is it something which you have to argue for, or is it a given that you can do it? No, it's definitely something that we have to argue for. <clears throat> well, in it differs a little bit if you or you have to sort of you have to onboard the people that you are collaborating with. So there's, I mean, in the relation between end users and client and experts internally, but also externally, it's, it's, it's very important that you start the process by, by, taking, by, by creating trust. And then being aware of that, I mean, if we just win a competition and we make these nice renders and then the mayor in the end and the, the end users can stand at that specific point, at that specific time of year, looking at the render, looking at the site and the, the realized project and it's the same. Then I mean it's a failure. So it's also a way of arguing that, that if, you, if you, you know, the project of, uh, of Gellerup, uh, this urban park, it took uh, five years to realize, four and a half years to realize. So if you don't learn and do the design in a process, then I, 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 I guess it's a bit of a failure, no? But you need to, to invest in that understanding from a start. Well, I mean, it's always about the process because... Yeah because we work with nature, but yeah. uh, there's still a difference between something which you deliver and then it grows into something else, or something which you have shown which needs development in order to, to, to fulfill the requirements for, of the project itself. Yeah, no, that's yeah but, but in, in general we say we cannot, we do 40% urban planning, and urban planning is a process. That's never a product or a specific design. So, and when you work, work with living matter, it's, it is, you know, from the day you hand it on over to the client, it's starting to grow, so that's actually where the life and the process starts. Mm. Um, yeah, I think... Um, maybe I don't understand your question right. No, no, I, do, I think you do. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> it's just uh, interesting that uh, you are if you sell a maintenance, uh, maintenance scheme, for yeah. instance, yeah, we do. that's obvious that you need time for it to, to show a result. Yeah. But then how do you? Ex but it might be difficult to argue for the money to be expanded to to extend the, the budget for more than two years. You know, yeah. so, because it's it's not regulated. It's much more difficult to. Yeah. I mean, that's what we would be confronted with. That's why I'm yeah, so okay. curious about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, but so it, it does, I mean, this is uh, in Örsta, the project about the maintenance budget that we then stretched over five years. That's uh, a local uh, ownership union. I mean, it, it was the city of Copenhagen that has all these maintenance paradigms of, of how to maintain. Then you need to take them in their hand and go to the specific site and say, well, this is, you maintain it too hard. Mm -hmm. uh, because you cannot do it like, you cannot maintain the St. Kils and Bryggervangen as, as a normal urban space in Copenhagen. And they are, and then you need to tease their, you know, curiosity on that. And they, I mean, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been easy, but it's, it's like a, starting a movement uh, or like changing the direction of a super tanker you have to do it like step by step and you know finding people inside the organization that are willing to to do something a little bit different uh, and then uh, yeah mm -hmm. taking so it's some kind of inviting an them on board yeah some kind of an educational process as well yeah but have, it is for us as which well you have yeah. also gone yeah. through i mean yeah um, which brings me to another topic, the second topic of three, <laughs> um, which is the shift of your design approach within SLA. I think that's an interesting issue because as far as I am uh, I'm familiar with your projects, and I, I mean, you have been, SLA has been a very famous firm for a long time. That's why we have 
come across some of your uh, some of the early projects as well, and they were much more about urban design, I would say, uh, than about what you have shown us today, about the na nature-based design, as you call it, which I think is a really really good term. Uh, so I would I would could you perhaps describe how, on the one hand, you shifted from a design focus to the nature focus a bit, perhaps, um, and on the other hand, also from perhaps uh, or, or also how you integrate your design intentions into the na na nature now. Because we have seen some quite some interesting design as well, which yeah. you could have described yeah. uh, if, if it had been a different focus, of course. So perhaps you could, could talk about that shift a little bit? Yes, well, in, in the... Um yeah, the shift. I've been with this LA since 2011, and there's always been, a t you know, an atmosphere of wanting to learn new disciplines, to learn something different, to do something different than we did yesterday. And we still have that ambition and that side kind of atmosphere at the studio. So, so, it's also because we we care about uh, we truly believe that nature has such a wide span of value proposition. So not only a nice a nice space or a space that takes care of the rainwater and makes this space more resilient, but also that actually uh, uh, creates uh, a safer environment. Uh, a new type of, uh, you could say, meeting spots. Uh, and, and, and in order for us to actually include that into the design, so it's not something that, you know, oh, wow, now it's safer. Uh, that it's actually, and, and, and also when you work in, in Gellerup, I mean, the residents are the client. So how do you include them into the design? I mean, we cannot do that as architects. I'm not trained, I'm trained as an architect. I'm not trained to do that. So that's why we have anthropologists because not, not only to, to, to facilitate a process like that with like the, 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 the residents' uh, democracy, but also to translate what the residents <clears throat> are demanding into a design. So, uh, does, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah so, so uh, and, and in general, it's uh, if you talk about aesthetics in a philosophical way, then it's you know historically related to the elite uh, thinking this is good or bad because I have more knowledge than you have, so I I define what is good, what is nice to look at. So that's kind of the yeah philosophical way of looking at aesthetics. The way we regard aesthetics is more on a scientific base, where the aesthetics of nature aspires all our senses as a person, as a peop as people has. We have a lot of senses, so not only our visual, but also how we feel and 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 how we how we care and how we uh, navigate. Yeah. And a lot of your projects seem to be some kind of a repair strategy of something which um, is either decaying or you know is old or needs some some refreshment or improvement uh, and my question then would be is is that uh, is your approach to introduce natural features into that repair thought is that something which you bring into the project or is it something which is asked by the client I mean do they look for you know is the brief oh, we need someone who designs an, a nature-based uh, new courtyard for that uh, social housing well that estate? differs a lot Lily hmm? and I mean, I mean that differs a lot and sometimes it's it's about I mean San Kelsen Brugger went back this housing street and the roundabout the idea was there to create more biodiversity in the city that was part of the brief. So it was one of the parameters. And in order for us to put that into a design and be specific about it, and also to gain data, to actually be, you know, hardcore, uh, 
what is happening here? Then we need to have that profession in house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also much more fun to work interdisciplinary because it's, uh, I mean, and and in general, architecture always. always have been <laughs> interdisciplinary. You no, know? I mean we work with engineers, we work with cities, we work with. I mean, I mean it, it is it is an interdisciplinary discipline from the start. But how did you open up to all these other disciplines? Because of course, interdisciplinary has been around for quite some time, but uh, the, the type of disciplines which were involved, they. they differ yeah. from you know, every decade, perhaps. True. So how did you, because you had said you have an, an anthropologist and uh, people you wouldn't think of in the first place. So how do you, do you add on new disciplines? Is it the need of a project or is it your own ambition in one of your retreats with the circle uh, where you think, oh, perhaps we should work together with someone from, I don't know. It's an investment. I mean, you, I mean, we've done, I mean, if three years ago, I couldn't, you know, get the client to pay for our biologist. But I was like, we were striving to make it break even at least. So kind of that's business oriented, and I guess you all know about that, that it's not me paying, uh, me or my partners paying the salary, it's the clients, no? So it has been an investment. But if you have such a, a purpose, and you have a, a studio as SLA where you cannot only you cannot only say a purpose. You need to follow up on it and and show the the data. Mm. I mean, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a crucial topic, I would say, because uh, you have to to be able to afford that as well. Yeah. In order. Yeah, to but also, uh, how do you include it into the design and the, and that it's. So like uh, you, you know, the starting conditions are right mm -hmm. for the purpose to be realized, uh, to create biodiversity, to put ecosystem services into, to, um, I mean, on a city scale, that means about, I mean, the biologists, they have a whole different way of working, both desktop analysis, but also, and putting that into a design is valuable because that's, um, but it takes time and in, in yeah. we, we need to invest in it. But also the phases in which you need these expertises True. are very different and that's something which makes it difficult, at least here I guess, that because for, in order to, to know all about soil and about the habitats which are there, yeah. you need a lot of inventory in the, in the beginning, perhaps yeah. even, you know, two years or one, at least one whole year to have all the life circles uh, and seasons of a year. So that's a lot of time which you sometimes, ha you know, it's hard to have it. And yeah. then also, of course, to pay. But uh, also the, the system of planning is something which has to change or adapt to that as well. Yeah. Is that what you experienced? Uh, yes. And we definitely experienced that the, the demand for our expertise is increasing. Which expertise? I mean, the one in blue, green, mm -hmm. connection, the whole way of, of looking into the city system, the whole way of making them more resilient, of adding nature on buildings, beside buildings, of getting getting the, that whole series of of values into into cities that definitely are demand. And then one thing which is really interesting for me is how you sh how you uh, cross scales. Is it, if you say you work on a master plan level, strategic master plan for livable cities, <laughs> that's what I wrote down. Yeah. Um, so the master plan level is a completely different scale. Is it something where you would also go down into the detail in the same place or is it different places where you work? That differs a lot. Every time I kind of look into a year's sum of project, I try to sort of put them into different categories, but it definitely differs a lot. I mean, it can go from, we did for a private client uh, a project in Milan, and that was definitely not part of the strategy to expand our market into Milan. So then I was like, okay, but we never talked about working in Italy, and then I was just, we cannot help doing this. 
I mean, we have to do it. it they are trying to do this innovation, innovation district where they want, it, they want us to clean uh, the water in, in, in the canal system by nature. And we have experience on that since 2001. We've done these type of projects where you actually add in species that cleans, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Anyways, so, so to be a little bit uh, direct, I mean, if, if the clients doesn't want our purpose, then, then, then we don't have a project. So we have to sort of, it's not, I'm not saying, do you like our purpose otherwise? Of course, of course you start the conversation differently, but, 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 but that's, that's how we operate, that's how we, uh, I mean, that's also to keep the level of, of keep evol keeping evolving, but also keeping the ambition and you know that that people are thriving. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what definitely motivates them is to do like a difference, but to do projects that differs. Yeah. Well, kind of the core of the project, if it's a big master plan, or if it's like the 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 harbor of Oslo, or if it's uh, a roundabout and um, and a housing street in Copenhagen. Uh, and what, what's your experience about uh, the the commissioner, the, you know, from public uh, public uh, services? Is it because what we experience here is that we have quite a lot of different departments dealing with different topics. So the environmental department, for instance, is something completely different than the planning department, and then. Uh, housing is different, and uh, so they have different goals and ambitions. And uh, for a project like that, the very positive thing would ha would have to happen that they work together as well as commissioners. So, do you bring them together, or don't you have to do that because they work together anyway? We have to bring them together. Ah, good. How do you do that? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's definitely a challenge. You start by asking questions. <laughs> But but uh, there's a funny story to this. Um, there was uh, we were invited to to New York after the superstorm Sandy, uh, that definitely hit Manhattan and uh, whole of uh, whole of New York State uh, very violently. Um, and then they were looking for solutions uh, to 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 do the, to make the city more resilient. And then we were like. I think five architecture studios and uh, five engineer companies invited over, and we had all, you know, this um, this um, this bag of uh, we, this is what we've done, and we're the best at, and so forward. And then we came into this space, and then there was like, and it's definitely a larger city, and more projects, and so forward. And then there was like the. The person in charge of the social housing, there was the person in, in charge of uh, parks and recreation for infrastructure, for collective traffic, uh, in, yeah, infrastructure and, 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 and roads and maintenance. And they said, well, and, and then uh, the, the, the climate adaptation in charge of that. Um, and then they started the whole meeting by saying, well, just to let you know, we have never been in the same room on this side of the table before. So then I was just like, okay, I have to completely redo my presentation because it's all about collaboration. It's all, so you're definitely addressing, and when you, when you are in a smaller country, I mean, that's, yeah. So, so the utilities, I mean, the pipes underneath doesn't know what happens, I mean, it's, yeah. So that was a, that was a, a life-changing uh, experience for us uh, to, to, uh, uh, to maybe not take for granted that in Copenhagen you can actually open the doors mm -hmm. uh, and you meet because it's smaller. Yes, and then, it, then you would also try or decide for yourselves at least who should be part of, of the whole game. Or, yeah. And also in terms of the citizens or the dwellers or on the other side of the of what, what you call clients uh, before in your project. Is it, is, are you integrating them into the, are you inviting them or is there a, a law saying that you have to participate, you, you, know, you know, you have to set up a, a process of participation for uh, 
uh, a social housing project or a urban development project or whatever? No, it's not regulated. It's it's, it's a it's a free market. And you are doing the whole process as well. What kind of process? The the, the uh, process for integrating, like for instance, in Gellerup, the the young people who want to play football and no, in Gellerup you have like a social housing, you have like a social entity that takes care of information mm -hmm. and I don't know how you do it here in Vienna, but that's that's how it is in Denmark. So then you collaborate with that person. So that's where our anthropologists are kind of connecting to them and understanding. So so we are, our anthropologist is kind of facilitating the gap between, or the conversation between content and democracy. Mm -hmm. But we're also starting these projects by saying, well, we are experts, and we have done this, this several times, and it maybe sounds a little bit arrogant, but we are experts in designing spaces, and you as residents or end users are exper experts in your daily lives, lives as they are today. And together, we must find a way for actually making a flexible space, but also an intervention that moves us further. So that's a way of you know starting, saying, well, you, if you just wanna wish, then you have like, six sets of table tennis tops and barbecues and dog uh, toilets. Uh, I mean, I mean that's the whole, that's the whole budget. So you need to be quite specific uh, uh, in saying, well, we are the experts on this part and you are the expert on that part. And together we have to find, you know, common ground. Uh, we, did, uh, a, oh, we did a road in uh, Sønder Boulevard for the city of Copenhagen, and that was uh, that was how we started that project, and uh, and then we said, well, later on you will find there will be space for tabletop tennis, there will be space for barbecues, but this that's not part of what we are doing right now. But we'll make flexible space for that, in order for your life to sort of evolve, but also your needs, uh, and your life in general. Um, should the public I think be we should open it up to the floor. <laughs> yeah, very good idea. Thanks. Any questions from your side? Is well, well, you aufgezeigt good? Right. No? This <laughs> way. That's Thomas. Thomas and I had a almost Sache Torte today. Yeah. <laughs> But it was will it come some kind of berry instead, berries. Ah, no, it's working. Uh, maybe I'm playing the icebreaker. Thanks, Mette, that you already said that we met each other today. Yes. Um, I'm trying now to play a bit the icebreaker because it was very an inspiring uh, uh, presentation of your uh, side, and especially. Um, to give a little bit landscape to architecture hope to see it a little bit more broad because of course we now here in Austria and I have to admit I'm a part of the Austrian Federal Association of Landscape Architecture called Ögler, just making a short uh, advertisement. We need the youth and youth students to know to make more pressure for landscape architecture because I would say I had the pleasure to study in Denmark and to being back in Austria was at one point a little bit frustrating, but now it's coming the good point. Um, I wanted to ask you back to the office because you're so broad, from the landscape architect to the anthropologist, what I love to hear, um, but as well the architects and so many technical um, colleagues. How was it possible to argue with your client or to argue financially that you were able to have three offices being so broad and to say, yeah, we bring a surplus into your project, not just planning something on the green space or trying to solve something, but we add something on it because those processes or those projects are sustainable in a different setup. Even maybe it's financially, as we heard, by the maintaining 
is it uh, is it uh, sustainable by the social terms because it cures maybe some issues but how was it possible to do this because what I face here in Austria, I would argue, you get you being happy as an office to get a client, <laughs> to win a competition, and then they're just landscape architects because you try to finance yourself and uh, survive basically, and not thinking over the box because you have no money left in the end. Maybe it's too broad, and maybe it's uh, it's feeling a little bit to Lily's uh, question, but I'd like to raise up once again because I think landscape architecture is something for the future, but we need as well some colleagues who are working with us. Adding to that, maybe uh, could it be that uh, the climate urgency we are facing is also like an entry ticket or a trigger for your profession? Definitely. I think it will, it's changing. I think you're so right. And I mean, we didn't arrange uh, the extreme rainwater event in Copenhagen. Um, so, and, and, and the kind of, you could say the, the benefit and the reason f is not only ours, it's also, you know, a demand. Um, but as a business that has grown into three studios, I think that's also because we are daring to do it and daring to push the agenda a little bit. Um, and then including in, I mean, when I started at SLA, we did a lot more projects that was like sub-consultants to building architects. That is a very, very small part of what we are doing today. And if we do it, we demand that there's a split between the, f the, the sum of money for the urban space, so what happens outside the building, there's a, you know, there's a, a safe gate between house, indoor, what's outdoor. Because in, otherwise, I mean, so I, I don't know how it is in, uh, in, yeah, in Germany, exactly but... Describe it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because it's, that that it's, was not like the start. When I start, when when we started, like ten or twelve years ago, it wasn't like that. So min, maybe you had like a sum for a project, a house and a park, and then uh, this was like ninety-five percent. The park was like five percent of the total sum, and then this, you know, always becomes a little bit more expensive. And then it takes okay. There's no space for the. There's no there's no money for the trees. There's uh, no money for the. We'll baby basically we just have a lawn or something like that, and we very soon argued that that we as a company we cannot work like that because then we cannot well, then we do very poor projects and and then we sort of started to shift that, and we did that by pushing politicians but also the you know the the people doing the regulation plans saying well, you need to have this division and then there was also, I mean, climate adaptation in cities and in general a need for more green and the change in paradigm from looking as, as nature outside instead of having it, you know, in the city as, as part of the urban, urban fabric. So it's a little bit a hard uh, question to, to, to answer, but in, in in 2000 and in 2011 to 2016 we did the international criminal court in Hague and that was done in a natura 2000 preserved area uh, and in order for us to design uh, a, a security regulating uh, regulated you know almost like a rampart but not something that is like Fort Knox. So how do you keep like open air in and light and, and in a Natura 2000, how do you work with that? Then we need to have like more disciplines on board. I mean, architects and designers cannot only solve that. Uh, and in order to get them actually into the studio, then you can both get influenced by that profession but you can also influence that profession. Um, so our biologists, they 
they have found SLA, you could say, more or less. And now we, we are more like known for having biologists. So now pe biologists are also, we also look for more biologists, but the first ones, and that also goes with the anthropologists that we started with, they actually found us because of our purpose. So does that make, is that an answer? Yeah. Maybe to make it even more uh, complicated or almost a little bit philosophical, like uh, I really liked about uh, the way you talked about the the situation in, in Gellerup, the demo demography, like the, a lot of young people, a lot of unemployed, and you didn't describe it as a problem, but as a potential, like a lot of people who can use these spaces and who can take care of these spaces and can kind of shape them in, in their specific way. And so this means like always, uh, really looking at things first, looking at the given and also working with the given, especially concerning the social fabric. But of course, on the other side, like uh, you're talking about nature-based design, but there's a lot of terraforming involved. So a lot of big machines and a lot of like doing it new from the scratch. So to what extent would it also be possible like also concerning the given nature, the given kind of wilderness or strange hybrid situations you have in the urban realm to work with that instead of doing this complete terraforming, yeah. which seems to be there in most of the projects? So the question was how to work with the existing city nature, yeah. for example, yeah. and enhance that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, one example is, um, when we planted these 600 trees in St. Kils and mm -hmm. then the acidity level of the soil for planting the whole understory was too high. So we needed to sort of understand how can we lower that in order for, for doing the planting. And then we went to, our, uh, to forestry. We also have a forest, forest candidate in the studio understanding about how do you maintain forest. Isn't it called forest candidate? Yeah. Okay. Um, and he said, well, you should just order a, a trunk of uh, uh, cone shells and shovel it into the soil and then it will take like a couple of weeks and then the acidic level is, is right. And we were just like, okay, that's a cheap solution. Let's try it. And we convinced the, uh, the city of Copenhagen to, to test it. And that's what we did. So that's another example of having, having these different disciplines in, in the studio actually makes the, uh, the design, but also what we do better. Well, you could also work with other offices, you know, with somebody from outside. I mean, you could also team up with different disciplines outside of your office. But of we, we do that. Yeah, I mean, we, a third of what we do is outside the Nordic countries. So it's in England, London, Manchester, Canada, Abu Dhabi. That's basically it at the moment. We tried a lot in Paris, but that was, and we still have some small projects, but that's super hard. It's so bureaucratic. I hope there's no French here, but that was really, <laughs> that was really like a long, a long term. Uh, but we are still, we are still. No, but I mean, that could be, sorry, that could be an answer to your question. You could also team up, yeah, with somebody else. You don't have to have them in the beginning. You don't have to have them in your own office necessarily. No, but it makes a more, it makes a better design. Well, it's, a, it's much more integrated, of course. But if It you makes start, a better design. The yeah. value, prop it's, not, it's not much more integrated, but it, it makes a better design. And that's also why we have technical person inside. Mm -hmm. It's because sometimes we can actually postpone the engineer to the detailed phases because we have, I mean, there is, it's, it's like driving a car, you know, if you only, you know, have, if you can only, you need to have a driver, you need to have a co-driver, you need to have an orientation, you need to somebody, I mean, it's, it's like being a collective team and where you cooperate and that's, 
Yeah, it's a lot harder if you have it like silos. It's a bit like you talked about the municipality and the cities. If you have like the silos, if you have it like in house, then you can get inspired and you can get it into the initial phases of a project. Mm. Yeah, well, I think and it makes the project stronger. It makes the opportunity for pushing the technical part of the design at an early stage. If you don't have it, it's like, okay, you just, can you please fix the, uh, the drains of, of this nice drawing of, of terrain that I've done? If you don't have it in-house, you don't, you don't have the right plant design in, that responds to the specific climate or to that specific soil or filters the noise or make a noise canceling sound of grasses so you can actually be outside in a, in a noisy uh, in a noisy neighborhood as the courtyard I showed so i yes we co what i meant about working outside the nordic countries is that we always collaborate with local architects landscape architects engineers we always do that uh, but if you have more expertise inside, then design is not only design, but you actually get the full value proposition out of the design, instead of adding it in. Yeah, I was just trying to give some hope to, the, to these people here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, have a, I have a very, um, I have a question from quite in the beginning about your planting schemes, because you said that you were talking about city nature. Is it city nature? Yeah, we yeah. call it city nature. Yeah, city nature. So it's not the natural. That's also some kind, uh, yeah. some response perhaps to Angelica's question: whether yeah, you work with the with the existing nature or you create new na nature in a way. Yeah. Um, and you, I mean, there is this landscape laboratory. I'm sure you're familiar with in I think Aarhus is it? Aarhus outside Aarhus. Aarhus yeah. yeah. Aarhus, yeah. yeah. And they have. Um, I was quite impressed by their experiments uh, combining different species, which are decorative species, like, I don't know, you know, pine trees with magnolias, which you would never put together. Yeah. Uh, but they had teams uh, of ecologists and designers, and they were trying to find out whether this forbidden combination in terms of ecology yeah. would nevertheless work and how it could work aesthetically, but also ecologically. And uh, you were talking about uh, tropical species, and uh, as far as I know, Copenhagen is not <laughs> a tropical country. <laughs> so uh, does that refer to some kind of an experiment like that? Or <clears throat> I didn't say tropical species. I, I said exotic species. Oh, exotic. <laughs> but. Um, I mean, all private gardens has exotic species. I don't know about Austria, but in... Oh, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's a way of... of uh, and, and there's a big difference between exotic species and invasive species. So, we are introducing it we mainly work with indigenous or native species, but we are introducing it where it's uh, contributing to the, the biotope, but also where the microclimate allows it. I mean, I've been to a series, many private gardens where you even had like peaches and uh, apricots uh, growing and bringing fruits. I mean, so it's, it's a way of, um, yeah, so that's why we do it. But is it, I mean, um, what I what I had the impression that you use it also to give an, a lush e expression True. to the place. Yeah. Because, of course, uh, if you only s stick to the local species, it might yeah. be completely different. And also, it's, it's very familiar to everyone. So if yeah. you have a wow effect, if you want to produce a wow effect, then that might help. So. Yeah. That was my question. <laughs> so how do you see that, Lily, using yeah. uh, indigenous or exotic plants or combining them? Well, I see it the work? same way. I yeah. see it the same way, yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, because it's also, I mean, there are, of course, uh, restrictions when it comes to, like, neophytes and uh, mm -hmm. uh, kind of dangerous species. But uh, for the rest, it, I mean, now it's changing anyway because of climate uh, 
yeah. shifts in Definitely. temperature, and yeah. uh, we have to we have to adapt our planting schemes to a large extent. I'm sure you do too. Yeah, and some it's what's exciting about doing projects outside the Nordic countries is that, to some extent, at least if you go to a site like. Uh, the UAE, the Abu Dhabi, it's kind of that they have forgotten their native species. And it's part of our cultural heritage. It's part of our legacy as humans. No, it's part of you know what we are embedded in. Uh, so sometimes it's almost, I can say it in, in a space like this, I guess, but it's almost easy in, in order to say, you have all these native species. Don't you want to sort of use that, we know that it can grow, we know that uh, the gaff tree can, and the acacia is super good here, it even creates nests for birds and, uh, uh, and attracts that into the city. So, uh, but sometimes it needs somebody from the outside in order to, to put that into a, and that's sometimes, I mean, at least internally at SLA, it was, this is a part of why we go beyond Denmark is because that we, we, we can deliver a certain value, but we also gain a lot of knowledge that we can put back into uh, in our local environment. And I think from, from you asked before, Lilia, and I think regarding all what, you know, plants and trees, I think you are much more experienced than I am. I'm not so knowledgeable about the specific, you know, about these trees. And, and sometimes, oh, you're from Isla, can you tell me what type of tree this is? And I'm just like, just a minute, I'll find my app. Um, uh, and can you tell me if it's good? Is it doing good? And, uh, no, I cannot. It looks like it's doing okay. Uh, so, uh, so just to get that on, um, uh, yeah, yeah, but that's why you team up. I mean, that's why we team up. Exactly. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> exactly. But the, the, the change in what we do and how we operate and where we operate comes from the first 15 years of realizing urban spaces. So I think to some extent that also makes us more like trustworthy. Mm. That we don't show images, but we show that we have actually done it. And that's also, you know, what gets us uh, up in the morning. That you can actually visit and see if it thrives. And it kills us with if there's a tree that doesn't thrive. Uh, um, yeah. But uh, what was really striking for me was uh, concerning like showing the project, uh, the the more recent projects like the roundabout and yeah. uh, and uh, let's say the backyard, like yeah. the long backyard. Uh, if you look at the drone images, I think they are completely boring because they don't have this image of landscaping yeah. and but but if we really see the images of people like being in there experiencing yeah. on, being on the ground i think that's the that's the only interesting perspective so it's 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 the usage it's not it's not the image from from a bird's view and i think this is really also a change in in, in landscaping sure. that's that's well, i found the roundabout really exciting from from the from i found it very exciting <laughs> but not from from a bird's view did you? Well, I found the fact very exciting how much space you can, you know, spare for a park rather than mm. a, a transport uh, mm. surface. It's, it's two thirds of the asphalt that is removed. Mm. Mm. And Vienna is quite paved. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've been here today, I've been here as a student, but this, yeah, there's, there could be spaces for more of that, even though you have fantastic parks. Well, as you were so in an, a really innovative uh, practice, I, I would, I wonder, that's a personal interest of mine, uh, have you ever or do you also uh, introduce projects which you, you know, think are necessary? Or do you work in competitions or, you know, ask, are you asked by clients only? Or do you, do you also develop something which perhaps you think is necessary on that spot? <laughs> we, 
I mean, it's hard to realize a project that is not, uh, you know, but we do a lot of investment in, in, in knowledge evolvement and we do invest in kind of an alternative to to how Copenhagen should develop. It is, Copenhagen is famous for a finger plan with the green. So we had like a, a we did a whole uh, several months of work where we said, okay, can we can we do it differently? Can we because the green in between the fingers of Copenhagen is actually not so green. So how do you actually make a more resilient city in, in general on a large scale strategic plan? So these type of projects we do. And then you saw the matrix. We also try to sort of collect and share. For example, we have like an, uh, a, a paper uh, saying about how should learning environment uh, be for, for school children. Uh, could you in, include uh, a different way of, of, of making schoolyards than just having them paved? Or a different way of learning math, uh, a different way of connecting, yeah, something like that. Mm. So that's, that's we have like, yeah. Between research and. Uh, yeah, and then we also do some, we have like a European, uh, what is it called? Uh, a EU, European Union, yeah, EU funded uh, project together with a sociological university in Portugal Portugal that was uh, that is about a uh, green and blue infrastructure in the social housing area uh, so that's a research project and we are we are doing different types of uh, of research in our R&D uh, yeah we are doing that yeah and um, because there are so many young people here uh, do you take interns we do, take, <laughs> we do take interns, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So there's a question. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing the information and all your experience. Yeah. It was very exciting. So, what I wanted to ask, and please correct me if that's wrong, SLA is defined that you are challenging yourself making bold decisions by um, tackling problems with a new way. And um, how, do you, like, how do you cope with doing these bold decisions? Because we are working also in the landscape office and our daily business is that we have to deliver a design that works and it needs to work with every condition that is supported by uh, governance or by the social housing. And sometimes they don't really have money so our planting design needs to work in first instance, and then it should look nice as well. But um, so as an expert, you are forced to say that this works 100%. It doesn't like there is a heat, but the plant will still cope with it. So, but if you try now a new way and a new approach, then you have this uncertainty that it would work because nobody ever tried. So how, how do you deal with it? Is it your, that you have so many experts within different fields and that you work together and you collaborate? And also, did that, was that a change within SLA so that you can now look back to the time when you had not so many experts in, within this entrepreneurial field that um, now you can feel or you can see it in the, within the projects, this change? that um, with these new challenges you are less afraid than you would have been 10 years before when you were just architect in your office? So the question was, could you maybe, that, that how, do we, uh, how do we dare to do it differently than we did it yesterday? Exactly, yeah. How to dare to experiment. Dare the experiment. You have to have the client on board of that too. Otherwise, I mean, I mean, you have to sort of have like a common ground. Uh, so we just we don't we don't just do it as SLA. I mean, that's not how we operate. We need to have the client, uh, you know, safeguarded and also the 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 
the city, uh, the maintenance people, the, I mean, you, you need to have that. Uh, and sometimes we do, in St. Kelsenbrunnen, we actually did a, did a pilot. We did like a small test together with the residents and together with the city of Copenhagen to sort of make sure that, that, that it was robust, the, the planting design and the plant species that we introduced. But in general, nature, it's not so complex. But I guess that's another thing that also the maintenance departments, the gardeners yeah. from the municipality, that their education, their training also has to change or they True. need a new knowledge because the way of gardening is changing rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, Was that an answer to yeah. your question? Maybe not. Yeah. Um, but just to get it clear, I mean, we, we cannot, as, as a design studio, even though we are interdisciplinary, but we still have like the main chunk of people is designers and, and city planners and, and architects. We cannot just, I mean, we need to have like a respondent. We cannot just do it without like, a, you know, uh, a collective, you know, okay, this is what we do. Um, hi, well, thank you very much for your uh, ideas, sharing your ideas, and earlier as you said, uh, it's always, you always start with building trust, and, um, but then how do you build trust on a very practical level with communities, uh, especially the people who live there, uh, who might uh, not know what you're doing, or who uh, uh, might are intimidated by, I don't know, big famous architecture office coming in, redesigning their existing context. How do you build trust? Do you have a specific scheme of uh, yeah, how to break down this barrier? No, we don't have one, one solution to that question. Gellerup, for example, I mean, we pushed forward this uh, a soccer field uh, with artificial grass and a stand and a light and so forward. And just before we were putting the artificial grass on top, you know, the gravel, everything was completely in level, so it was like zzz. Some of the young boys took this, uh, their motorbikes, the scooters, and drove into this gravel and made these super nice traces. Um, and then um, the social housing union, went straight to them and said, this is a really bad idea because we're doing this for you. Uh, and that is, that is kind of outside of, we were not part of that, we were just part of doing the detailed design. But that gave us food for thought in order to, to engage them into the process. Because since then there has been no harassment whatsoever at that, uh, in that park. Do you understand what I mean? So. We don't have, uh, but what I'm trying to say is that the projects that we do, they need to be like a common interest in making more nature in a project. Otherwise it would be somebody else, another design studio that they would need to engage. And if you start on that common ground, then there's like, building up trust by showing we could do it like this, by making them part of the decision. Even if you have like the team of, 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 of companies doing that, to, from an engineer company to like a, a facility management, I mean, then, then there's all, always, if you make these teams and you invest in the dialogue and in the relation and, and in the starting, of a project, then trust somehow uh, comes along most of the times. I think there was a question over there somewhere. Even two of them, I think, one in the, in the middle and one in the rear road. Mm. 
I actually wanted to come back to kind of the plant species. Um, I was, uh, during COVID, I think I was one of the few people that actually stopped buying plant, house plants um, because I realized how unsustainable the houseplant nurseries are and it was sort of in the same time. And you said you cooperate a lot with three nurseries and I wanted to ask you about your approach um, to um, yeah, to this cooperation and whether, uh, you know, because bringing the nature to the city shouldn't mean that we're taking this nature, nature away, away from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And for example, with house, plant, house plants, it's <coughs> completely unsustainable because it uses this super fertile soil, etc. So we actually shouldn't really be doing it on such a big scale. But anyways, I wanted to ask whether maybe in Denmark it's a bit different with nurseries and whether your approach in this cooperation has changed there. Well, the reason we collaborate with nurseries is because we always go out and select the trees. Not always, but most of the time. Let's say, 80. for the urban spaces we do in the Nordic countries, we always go with like the sum of money and buy the trees and the plants. That's not common in Denmark. But that's something where we can get more value on, on the trees and on the, uh, the plants uh, for money because we have the specialist who knows that let's try to do that specific tree and let's test the ones that you have on uh, unsellable uh, because they look different. Uh, so they are not completely like, you know, um, you know, like a typical uh, road tree. Uh, and if you, if you just like order trees and plants by a, you know, by, a, by sending an order, then you get like one type of plants and trees. But if you actually engage and gain knowledge on how you make a more uh, a more longevity part of a, select a tree that maybe is a little bit odd, but maybe is more sturdy and more robust in an urban environment. Um, so that's why we have the collaboration, and it's not only in Denmark, it's in all over Europe that we have plant nurseries that, that we buy plants for, from, from, for our clients. So that's where the interest sort of starts, is that we are kind of uh, known for selecting trees that is a little bit different. Also species of trees. Are you trying to somehow influence also uh, the system of how plants are being grown in the nurseries? Or no, not yet. You know, because we're but, bringing but, uh, the uh, trees two years, yeah, 30 two. years old tree, then it must have been growing somewhere else and it required... I mean, I just... Uh, I just wanted to ask whether you're also integrating that as part of well, the... I, I think it's a very interesting question for yeah. the future of landscape architecture, Definitely. also a little bit connecting to what I said about terraforming and yeah. versus uh, working with the given, like to have to see it really as a network of relations and, and, and a continuous web where, where everything is interconnected and you've taken it from there and putting it there, you, you're, you're, wo you're wounding something. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, you're also destroying something. I yeah. think this, we know this for architecture, for building, that it's really invasive, invasive and it's destroying a lot of uh, territory and, and, and nature, but of course also landscape architecture can, can yeah, have next, a problem in that way. Sorry, the next step would be to have yeah. an own nursery, no? Because yeah. if you have an own nursery, don't, you don't have transport. That's also something. <laughs> 
I think we could make maybe a last round of questions and, and, and then we have to wrap it up. Oh, no, finally, it's the final call. <laughs> I, think that, I think that one was waiting for some time. Hello, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation first. Um, I wanted to come back to the, or not wanted, um, uh, to the social aspect, to know about if you if we have different zones, also social zones, social controlling zones in what in in spaces. Um, if you incorporate or dealing and also planning them, how how do how do you deal also with um, security and lightning, and also if you incorporate some hidden hidden corners where it's really dark or where you really can rest out, or um, if some social groups um, can step back and have not this normal um, efficient working daily life. Um, day <laughs> or whatever um, yeah if if you deal or if yeah if you include this as a social um, issue yeah and, maybe, and maybe, also yeah. yeah maybe I would like to take the second question also from here to speed it up a little bit because it's I think we are getting quite late there was yeah here and then uh, thank you, Madam. My question is quite short. Uh, you said the roundabout project was a kind of a pilot project. And do you think it's becoming a role model uh, also outside of the climate district? And if so, is this push or demand coming from the city or also from the residents who wants to transform their space outside of the building? Well, that's an easy one to... Uh to uh, answer. Um, of course, I mean, the model, the way of working with this roundabout and this housing street is applicable in other roundabouts and other streets, but it needs to make sense in order for the hydrological circuit and the capacity of rainwater. So it, it sort of depends on, you know, the, the blue and green infrastructure of, of uh, of a neighborhood or of an area. Uh, and then again, it depends on what is at stake, what type of growth medium, what type of soil, and what type of uh, issues are we dealing with. Yeah. But the city of Copenhagen is looking into making a, you know, some kind of method of, of greening, greening the city more. Even though the city of Copenhagen it seems quite green, it isn't related to London, like in amount of green, or related to Malmö. That's just Vienna. opposite the bridge. What? Or Vienna. Or Vienna. Is Vienna very green? No. <laughs> no. Okay. It depends on the distribution. There are large green, there's a large percentage, but it's the way it's distributed uh, on the cityscape. Yeah. I think it's also different. But the, the, the first question, I think, was related uh, towards to uh, like social organization and security and conflict and stuff like that. Well, in that respect, I mean, it's, it's a little hard to, to answer because it differs so much from, from project to project. Uh, but um, in general, we are, we are trying to get the discipline of anthropology and sociology into the process so we don't you know, just say, okay, in the end, now it's safer, but we know how to navigate in a certain area in order to get the aspects as a starting premise so you can follow it up and you can make it even better. Uh, so, I mean, for Gellerup, the key issue was to create a safe, a safe outdoor space. And you don't only do that by illuminating it. I mean, that can even sometimes make it more unsafe. 
because it glares and you know it blinds and so forth. Um, yeah, I I don't know how to exactly answer your question. To be honest. Mm -hmm. Subculture groups can go rückzug or something. That ah, <laughs> if they're niches. And, and like if they're niches, like yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. I mean, in Gelderhof, yeah, there's like spots where yeah. it's optimized for uh, women, young women, mm. and where, you know, to, to sort of get like, but always, you always have like a visual connection between spaces, so it's not never blocking. You never have a blind spot. That's how we designed the series of spaces in that park. Mm -hmm. So you don't have like exactly there. You do. You do have like, uh, you know, upstamaltre. I don't know how to say that, <laughs> but that you get the the the, the trunks are, are more linear, where you move around. So you actually get like visual. You don't get those dark spots, so so you feel unsafe. And uh, as Mette had been has been in our uh, was in our permanent exhibition this afternoon or this morning, I, and we talked about the Danube Island, the Dona Insel, which yeah, is I like a, a very classical project in Vienna, which is also part of our permanent exhibition. Whoever hasn't been in our to visit our permanent exhibition, a lot of young people here. You have to go. You see the Danube Island and many other projects because we have some very interesting examples of creating this niche and and the line. Al allowing different scenes, so I think it's still a very valuable a very case study. Also, the way it developed, but it well, there are there are movies on the website of our institute, uh, yeah. interviews of okay. uh, people who have created the Danube Island. That's fantastic. So, if you like to go, to go into go that, that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you could do that. Yeah. So, two uh, advert advertisement <laughs> now, and I think we stop adverting ourselves and just wrap it up now. We we run quite late and. But it was a lovely evening. It was a very interesting evening, I Thank think. Thank you very much. Also for me. Huh? Thank or, you for or, all the good questions. Thanks, all of you, such a lot for coming. I, I would just uh, add a short advertisement, too, if that's possible. Uh, what? A short advertisement, if we are all... A short good. advertisement? Because, uh, if you are... Yeah, just uh, because there was this lovely um, debate now about landscape architecture. And of course, there is a lot of youth who is interested in landscape architecture. At the Ögler, the Austrian uh, Association for Landscape Architects, we have a kind of Friday bar on the 25th of November in Stumpergasse at the Haus der Landschaft, where we'd like to extend those debates with the youth and hopefully we bring the landscape architecture forward here in Austria. Sorry for the advertisement, but it would be lovely to see. And not the only grumpy landscape architects here from Austria. <laughs> So go there. <laughs> Thanks a lot.